Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, Ad Nauseam listeners, to episode 40 of our little podcast. My name is David Noe. I'm here in the Vomitorium with my good friend, Dr. Jeff Winkle. How's it going, Jeff? Doing very well today. How about you? I'm excited. Because, You're excited about yes. this episode or oh, just I'm, in general? Not, not in general. Oh. I seldom use the E word, but... That's here, why I was so shocked. Yeah. <laughs> here I'm using the word excited because yeah. my friend, Dr. Mike Fontaine, is coming back into the Vomitorium to record with us the rerun you never heard. That's right. We had an aborted attempt... Um, at the first time around, but um, we're back in business now. Yeah, lots of tech diffs the yeah. first time. Yep. But now uh, we're good to go. So uh, welcome to How to Tell a Joke with Dr. Mike Fontaine of Cornell University. Our shout out as we get started here is one that frankly is a little bit overdue, don't you think? I think so too. This yeah. goes to, uh, how do we say his name? It's uh, Michael Krogh. Krogh. Yeah. A graduate of Calvin University, nay, Calvin College in 2006, BA in Latin Education. Uh, presently a teacher at uh, Academy of the Sacred Heart in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Teaching Latin. Yes. yes. He, he was one of your students, right? Did you never have Mike? No, because Michael? I came to Calvin in 2007. Oh, man, you missed out. It's a close miss. You missed out. I loved having Michael in class, along with his uh, his twin brother, so who, if he plays his cards right, might get a shout out at some point. I, I wouldn't bet on it, yeah, that, but actually. But not only, not only tremendous students... But hysterical. Yeah, really? Yes. yes. <laughs> he says, uh, also moonlights as a major in the United States Army Reserve. That's right. That's right. And uh, sometimes goes away for a year to places where most definitely humans do not flourish, he says. <laughs> uh, he says, I had Jeff in medieval Latin my final semester at Calvin, one of my favorite classes ever. I remember it very well. That's some high praise, Winkle. Yeah. And he took a summer course on Augustine with uh, yours truly. And uh, I think he is one course and one exam away, probably finished by now, from getting an MA in classics at Villanova. I always knew I liked Michael a lot, but I learned fairly recently that uh, his favorite movie of all time is uh, Office Space. Oh. And that's in my top three. That's in your top so three. So it was just another reason for me to, to, okay. love, to love the guy. So thanks so much for listening, Michael. And uh, thanks especially for keeping the flame alive, teaching Latin out there in the hinterlands. Such a absolute crucial service that you provide. Indeed. And our opening quote this week, Jeff, is from Mike's book. It's from the introduction, page 27. Uh, quote, Jay Sankey is a veteran stand-up comic and the author of Zen and the Art of Stand-Up Comedy. As he puts it, quote, I do not believe someone can be taught to be funny. Not from a book, not from a 32-week course. Either you're funny or you aren't. But if you are a naturally funny person, I believe you can learn to be a stand-up comic. So though I don't believe funny can be taught, I do believe stand-up can be taught to funny people. Hmm. What do you think there, Winkle? By and large, I would buy that. Uh, um, I, I mean, in many things, most things I would say, I'm much more of a nature versus nurture guy. Yes. Yes. And so I think that, yeah, you're either born with the funny or you're not. It's, it's inter interesting to watch my, my boys grow up and uh, them to attempt humor. And they do it a lot through imitation. Right? They, they repeat lines they hear in, in movies or, uh, or they'll do like a, a little routine from, a, from a, a comedian that I'll play on the, on the house system. And so they learn by kind of imitation. But I think that like, timing and expression, you know, all those other intangibles that come with humor, they cannot be taught. Are you primarily um, tasked with teaching these things to your sons? Uh, not in a kind of a formal kind of no. way. Right? I, you that, try to set an example? I set an example, right? You know, and How's that working out? <laughs> It's working out great. My kids okay. are hilarious. So we were talking not on the way over here today, but the you know the episode that wasn't yeah. about different kinds of funny. Mm -hmm. And you and I both share a predilection for funny by repetition. Funny by repetition. If it isn't funny the first time, maybe it will be the hundredth. The hundredth time, right? And if it is funny the second time, it definitely will be the thousandth. Right. And we've also talked about, or at least I have, about how I think there's a gendered component component to that. that okay, let's hear it. That men are much more much more drawn to humor as repetition. It's like David Letterman. If mm. you remember, he would, you know, do some stupid joke at the beginning yep. of the episode, which would get kind of a chuckle. And then he beats it into the ground, and right. by the end of the hour, it's hysterical. Yes, or the um, the bit he had, know your cuts of meat. Yeah, <laughs> right. So Not I think that's another side of it, that we also have an appreciation. Absurdity. Absurdity, absurdity exactly. Right. 
So Mrs. Winkle is a witty woman. She is. But she doesn't go in for the repetition. No, she does not. Right. She uh, always accusing me of old material. Yeah. So you, you tell a joke. It's funny. You move on. Yeah. No, that's not how it works. Is, it is not how it, <laughs> it was works. good once is better the second <laughs> that's time. That's right. Right. Yeah. And we've talked about other kinds of humor. There is um, there's slapstick, mm-hmm. a, a kind of cruelty. I like watching epic fails, you know, on YouTube. These yes. Poor folks falling off bicycles and off their skis and so forth. Did you grow up on the like uh, on the Three Stooges? You know, yeah, slapping and poking. And, oh, definitely. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Stooge blocks and yes, yeah, twirling around on the floor. There's also verbal comedy. Uh, Mike's going to get into uh, some puns and things like that. That's when, right. When we start the interview in just a moment, um, there's funny words, right? Like when one word sounds like another word. Mm-hmm. I think that's called assonance. Assonance, yes. But to, 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 <laughs> Which is a funny word in itself, it is, isn't it? it is, exactly. You're just letting that word kind of hang out I was out just there. waiting. <laughs> so we're very glad to welcome Dr. Mike Fontaine into the studio here, the Vomitorium, again, right, Jeff? Once again. Yep. This is not the first time. No. Nope. For our listeners, with the rerun that they did not hear the first time. That's right. Yeah. So thank you for joining us, Mike. And uh, could you again tell us what uh, drew you to the study of classics and to the um, composition of this fabulous book you've written? Absolutely. It's all on the missing footage, though, David. No, I, uh, so uh, I can tell uh, our audience that uh, I grew up uh, outside New Orleans, went off to college with no idea what I wanted to do, met a wonderful professor who introduced me to classics in a course. So I did an undergrad degree at Millsaps College with wonderful professors. And then I went off to grad school. But in the interim, I had met the great Reginald Foster in Rome. And uh, that incredible teacher of Latin, hopefully known to many, at least by name, hopefully uh, also some in person to your audience, um, taught me almost everything I ever thought I could ever learn about Latin. I got uh, the great good fortune to spend a summer and then an entire year with him at the Gregorian University. So, yeah, it gave me a chance to do Latin actively, passively, and mostly not be afraid of not having the commentaries and that kind of thing. Right. So after uh, that, I finished a PhD at Brown University. I wrote a dissertation on jokes in Roman comedy. Mm. Uh, so never let anybody say you can't make a living off of it. <laughs> and uh, subsequently, I was appointed at Cornell University 2004, and I've been here ever since. So 17 years, I think we just finished up. And um, just about a year and a half ago, I think, Uh, I decided to do a sequel to a book in the same series. The book was called, uh, that first book was called How to Drink. And it was the world's, it is the world's first guide to the art of drinking responsibly while having a lot of fun. Now, did you get an endorsement from um, Budweiser or one of those kinds of places? Some of the fraternities around here are especially big fans of the entire. (laughs) 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 They're asking me about it. Um, Interestingly, that book was written by a, you would say, an assistant professor of classics in the Reformation. The guy lived in the 1530s in Germany, and he saw the college students getting blitzed. You know, Germany had fraternities back then. Mm -hmm. Guys were drinking till they got, you know, blindingly drunk. And so he wrote this uh, inspired by Ovid to try and get him to stop. Anyway, that book came out in April 2020. And uh, right around the same time, I pitched this one to my great editor for the series, Rob Tempio at Princeton. I said, you know, Cicero and Quintilian have the only two treatises on the ancient world on humor, what it is, jokes, how they work. And I can't promise you they're the funniest jokes you've ever heard in your life, but they have the mechanics down. Hmm. They understand what humor is and how you can get ahead. So as I've been describing the book to people, how to tell a joke, I say it's a lot like this classic book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yes. Mm. Dale Carnegie, is that the author? Exactly. Yeah. That's a book everybody should read. It. Right. I'm 0 for 2. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to put some in a box and send them your way. Well, okay. this book, uh, that great book doesn't say anything about humor. And as you probably know, you know, humor is a tricky thing, especially at work. And so Cicero and then later Quintilian, looking back, were interested in how can you use jokes for social influence? So anybody who's on social media might be interested in that, right? How do you Mm -hmm. get like an epic meme that's going to go viral and get you a million likes? How do you take down your enemies? But also, how do you say something kind of witty and make new friends? And uh, they stress over and over, like sort of, There's some dangers inherent in humor, right? You know, one is that you can offend people. They say Mm -hmm. different categories, but another is telling too many jokes and coming across as a clown. 
Mm-hmm. And they really don't want to do that. That's not what we're f- trying to do here in professional life. So in terms of, Mike, uh, making friends and influencing people, uh, our association began back in, I believe, 2013, right? When when you and our mutual friend, Jason Petticone, you came out to uh, what was then Calvin College, and uh, you uh, co-led the uh, Bidouum Calvinianum, right? The two-day spoken Latin conference, and you gave a, a really riveting lecture on Plautus, and was that the, was it the Mustelaria that you were talking about then, or was it the Benaikmi? Yeah, it was 2013. It was a wonderful visit. I remember it vividly, and I talked about the Menaikmi, which is the okay. one play of Plautus everybody absolutely has to read. It's identical twin boys separated around age seven, and uh, they grow up for about 20 years, and then on the day of the play, one has been looking for the other, and they meet. Almost. They meet everybody except each other until the very end. <laughs> Hilarious. Very, very funny play. And a direct uh, influence on um, Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors. Isn't that right? That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah. Uh, the inspiration for that were The Boys from Syracuse, which mm. was a stage musical that came out, I think, in the 60s, maybe the early mm. 70s. Yep. So as we approach the book here, How to Tell a Joke, it has this brilliant red cover, and we're actually giving away two copies of this to lucky listeners, so check out the social media. But it has this brilliant red cover, and it is reminiscent. You have to tell us, please, if this was deliberate. It's reminiscent of a Harvard series, uh, the Loeb Classical Library. Was that was that intentional? I don't think I know that series. You don't know that one? <laughs> no, this book is original. You are in any way trying to... Oh, I'm insinuating. <laughs> We're not, no, you know, the color is... The first cover that they gave me as a proof was lavender. Mm. And I said, I'm just not really feeling lavender as the mm-hmm. color for humor. So if you look at the series, they are trying hard to line up the color in some associative way. So how to die has a black color. Uh, Ah. How to think about God has a white cover. Interesting. Um, They got a brilliant new one on how to make up your mind, I think it's called. And by Sextus Empiricus, and half of the cover is black and the other half is black. (laughs) That's perfect. So, you know, look at this lavender thing. And we've got a brilliant image. I had a guy Photoshop a a microphone stand into Cicero's outstretched hand. Hmm. Um, This is a famous statue that listeners will see when they make it to Rome. If you go to the Supreme Court building there in Rome, uh, he is on the outside nearest to... um, Castle San Angelo. Anyway, so we might, we photoshopped it and I said, what color would be good? So I said, how about some kind of Looney Tunes, uh, you know, orangey red, something I associate with a clown or something. And I thought this color pretty much hit it. I like it very much. Yeah, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant cover. Hey, my, before we get too deep into the book, there's a question that I wanted to ask last time um, at the beginning that, that I didn't. Um, as you were you know, talking about your own kind of education and background, what did your parents think? Did your parents ever just say you're studying what you're going into what or uh, did you did they were they just hey you love it go for it I'm just I'm just curious yeah it's a great question so the answer is they they definitely did but I will say uh, and and I appreciate this now with every passing year that I've been a professor I had the greatest parents in the world they said go to college and study what you want hmm. will succeed in life if you keep trying hard you know I've been a good student in high school and they said you just keep trying hard do your best. And you will find your passion. You'll learn something because, um, you know, what do most college kids do or what did I do? You know, I went off and they said, well, you're a smart kid. You should be a doctor. Hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't really want to be a doctor. And all my friends are studying to be doctors. They don't really want to be doctors either. <laughs> uh, and so, which is true, right? I mean, at the end of like the prestige of getting into med school, then you actually have to go and become mm. a doctor. Uh, and um, no, my parents were supportive all the way through. And um they were most pleased, you know, graduate funding in higher ed for classics is still pretty much 100% paid if you make it into a PhD program. Right. And when my parents saw that, they said, well, they said, he must know what he's doing. So, all right. <laughs> and, you know, my dad shook my hand and my mom gave me a kiss and they said, go seek your fortune. So yeah. that's well for me. Have you got them to read any Plautus, though? Yeah, I wouldn't say my parents are the biggest family, <laughs> or even any family member for that matter, but they've yeah. always been supportive. Um, no, you know, I'm working on a book uh, right now, actually, a sequel to this one called How to Grieve. And mm. I've been reading it with my mom, actually. Uh, mm. It is um, it's a Renaissance reconstruction of Cicero's famous lost 
speech, the consolation. It's the world's first consolation to himself. So if you've heard of Boethius and these other mm-hmm. people, they were inspired by this lost speech when his daughter died. And the uh, speech was very famous for about four or 500 years, went missing, reconstructed in the Renaissance. And it's so touching and so affecting um, that I've had my mom sort of, you know, we've been reading back and forth on some of these passages. I say, does this sound right? She's like, no, you need to tweak that. Hmm. So, so cool to- way. That, that's know? really great. I love that. So yeah. two questions about that. What what color is the cover going to be? Is it going to be gray, perhaps? Uh, I think blue, right? Had a blue. blue. Yeah, I was thinking like a, a, a deep blue hmm. uh, to suggest sort of discouragement, depression, sadness. Hmm. And then the second question is, when you were here last time, the episode the listener will never hear, you you teased us with the um, the possibility that this is actually what Cicero wrote this, I mean, the, the, what has been rediscovered, but here you said reconstructed. So you tipped your hat a little bit. You see, I'm listening carefully. You care to say anything about that? Sure. We're getting closer to publication, I guess. Uh, yeah, I should have teased it, but I also don't want, you know, uh, misinformation getting out there. So what happened was um, in 1573, the Renaissance is coming to an end in Italy, right? Uh, and in Venice, in this bookshop, there suddenly appears copies of this new book, and it says, Marci Tui Ciceronis Consolatio Ad Se Ipsum. You know, Marcus Tui Cicero's Consolation to Himself. And there's no introduction of any kind. It's just this long speech. And as you read the thing, it's in like 100% Ciceronian Latin. Mm. It's amazing. It echoes uh, everything we know of Cicero's relevant letters at the time of Cicero's Tusculan Disputations, which was written right around the same time. Uh, So a lot from book three of Cicero's Tusculan Disputations, but also everything else. I mean, and immediately people said, oh my God, where's this thing come from? There's no manuscript, no introduction. And so this war of words broke out. Uh, It was anonymous when the thing came out. And uh, because it it was, you know, purported to be Cicero's. And so a firebrand young professor at the University of Padua, attacked it. He said, this thing's a fake and there's no way I'm going to let this pass as the real deal. But immediately he was defended by sort of the senior professor, this guy's uh, former professor himself, a guy named Charles Sigonius. Mm. Uh, he's probably not famous for much, but he was at the time a very famous influential historian of Italy, uh, writing in Latin. And he defended it. And the two of these guys, they carried on this literary polemic for about four or five years. And... Uh, the interesting thing is Sigonius went to the grave swearing that it wasn't fake. Hmm. Uh, and the, the other guy, Riccoboni, he more or less had the goods on this guy. And they did it off stylistic, but it wasn't clear. And so for hundreds of years, scholars went back to this thing and they said, is it real or is it not real? Uh, and it was included in Cicero's um, Obera Omnia editions until about 150 years ago. Really? Yeah, yeah. If you go back to a Teubner before 1860 or so, you'll find it there. I did not know that. For our listeners, the Teubner are the, the German editions of classical texts. Exactly. And right. sort of the traditional, this is the main place to find anything you want. Yeah, the be best a- philology. And in 1999, somebody devised a, com- a team, put together a computer program. And if you think of what a computer could do in 1999, right? Uh, you think, well, maybe we could redo it. And, you know, it crunched all these statistics and it says, well, you know, these word comparisons, it's probably not by Cicero. Hmm. And so as I was doing this edition, I found a smoking gun that proves it's not by Cicero. Oh, Mm. Uh, smoking gun. There we go. But it's it's fantastic. It'll be a sequel in the same series. It should be out late next year. Excellent. Looking forward to it. So as we get into this book itself, uh, you start out by explaining um, something about the stand-up consul, which is on the cover, right? Cicero as the stand-up consul, and you use the term consularis scurdra. And uh, I'm hoping you can explain to us a little bit. Yeah, that is what Cicero's enemies called him, according to the ancient biographer. They said, this guy is a scurra. Now, that's our word scurrilous in English, mm-hmm. but that doesn't quite get what it means. Um, that's a word that changes its meaning over time in Latin, but in Cicero's time, it seems to have meant a buffoon. And then a consularis buffoon would be a buffoon who had been a consul. So I kept going over and over, how am I going to translate this thing? A consular buffoon. Well, that doesn't mean really anything to anybody. And also the word consul doesn't really get it in English because we have the same word, 
But again, the consul of ancient Rome was the president of ancient Rome in the Republic. Uh, they had two of them, just not to mislead anybody listening. They had two of them elected every year. Cicero was consul in the year 43 BCE, 63 BCE, sorry about that. But what does it mean, right? So his enemy said, you are a consul who presents in public like a stand-up comedian. Okay. And boy, did that get me in a frame of mind, right? I mean, as you look around the world, just in the last five, 10 years, comedians have won elections in several different countries. Right. Uh, in Ukraine, they've got a prime minister who was a comedian. Italy, they have somebody who made it almost to the tip top. Brazil, I think, has got a comedian. Mm -hmm. uh, you think, huh, if you think about the connection between jokes and political power, right. the, the biographers were on to something, right? And Cicero, uh, you know this if you've ever read any speech, right? The guy's a total smart ass. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, it's interesting to see his enemies thought he was taking it too far and degrading the office. But what did he do? He keeps winning all the way to the top. The guy comes from some backwater province city. Arpinum. I've been there. There ain't too much. I don't think there was too much more back in his time. And he makes it to Rome. He's a novus homo, right? This right, is basically right. uh, an upstart. And you say, this guy's never going to make it. And what does he do? He wins and 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 he wins all the way to the top as president, as consul, the earliest possible age. Pretty cool, right? Yes, absolutely. So stand-up comedian, Consularis Scurdra, and uh, as you were saying, comes from humble beginnings, Arpinum, he's a novus homo, and rises to the very top of the political world, but he has kind of an uncontrollable urge, is this fair to say, an uncontrollable urge to lampoon his opponents, sometimes to his own detriment. That's exactly what Plutarch says. He says, okay. this guy didn't know when to stop. Hmm. Right? Because if you make a joke at somebody's expense, uh, they never forget it. No. <laughs> and some of the people, you know, in Cicero's public persona, he's ridiculing some of these people pretty harsh. Uh, if you read some of these speeches, uh, you can see evidence of it. And then, you know, uh, he did it worse to Mark Antony than anybody else uh, mm. in the Polypics, right? So the speeches for the very end of his life, you, I, in my own view, I would say Cicero kind of martyred himself to try and uh, stop Mark Antony. It didn't work. And so Mark Antony had him hunted down. He right. was roasting Mark Antony alive over and over and over with these uh, cutting insults and that sort of thing. So since right. we're talking way too far. Since we're talking to a legitimate expert here, I want to test something out. I, um, I often tell students that the, the standard w uh, way of making fun of an opponent is that you, you call them first um, a drunk, uh, and secondly, you call them homosexual, and third, you uh, say they're guilty of incest. Is that a, a pretty standard uh, plate of of Roman insults, whether they meant them sincerely or not? This is kind of what you do. Uh, definitely the drunk and definitely the incest. Yeah, okay. those are the ones that stick in my mind because uh, the incest charge gets bandied around everywhere. Right. <laughs> and uh, so it's an interesting way of thinking about it, because one thing that comes out with the speeches and the humor alike from the late Republic is how much of an old boys club it was. Mm -hmm. and it's not really the culture that I think we have here in the United States, but it is the culture that I sort of see from the outside. And, and as I'm told by some people who live there in England, right? Where mm. people say the most unbelievably outrageous things about you. And then they, they all just kind of shake it off and go get a pint of beer together. No right. Well, the, there's that, you know, in the, the, the parliament where they're you know, where the prime minister has to be you know, kind of more or less roasted. Um, but in the round, it's fascinating to watch. And, you, you know, there's all of these, you know, here, here, and, and booing and, and hissing um, right in the moment. And they're trying to imagine that happening in the, in the U.S. Senate is, uh, I'd kind of like to see it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't we're going to see it anytime. That'd be pretty interesting. Yeah. It must have been like that in ancient Rome, though, right? Yeah. Uh, where everybody's admiring how sadistic, mean, cruel you can be with this stuff. Now, how did this, I mean, how did this square... At, if at all, with with Cicero Stoicism, I mean, is is this idea that when you're kind of you know on the stage and in the moment, you that's compartmentalized because it seems like a very unstoic thing to do to just kind of like to, to, to go too far with your insults. Um, that's a great question. One thing to say, you know, Cicero was not a bona fide Stoic, so Stoicism would have done better. He would have done better with Stoicism. <laughs> he was a an academic skeptic, right? So a Platonist. Mm. Okay. Uh, Plutarch. That does come through right at the very end, right? You know, when the, the Republic is falling apart, he's like, oh, there's actually a joke about it toward the very end. I think it's in Quintilian. 
Uh, Cicero can't make up his mind. Should I go with Caesar? Should I go with Pompey? He said, what else would you expect from an academic skeptic? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, the, the joke about, but uh, so no, you know, we have these stories that Cicero lost his nerve. There's the speech uh, pro Milone uh, on behalf of Milo and the right. guy that uh, there'd been this murder on the Appian Way. Um, if you read the speech, it's fantastic. And we have this anecdote somewhere. I can't remember where it surfaces. Uh, that says Cicero didn't actually give that speech, but when he stood up to speak in public, he his knees started wobbling, he chickened out, and he stammered through something else, and Milo got convicted. And so Milo wrote him a letter after saying, that's a great speech, Cicero, if you'd actually delivered it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't that- be living in Marseille eating these delicious fish. Isn't that the one where Clodius's supporters all stand up in the balcony at the same time and spit on cue? That's the... If I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I remember the last time I read that with a class must have been at least 10 years ago, probably more like 15. And it was very hard to sort of picture the political environment where that kind of thing would have happened. But now, of course, it's much easier to imagine scenarios of, you know, people ganging up, intimidating politicians, that sort of thing. So, right. It would have been a tweet storm, right? If we were to... uh what contemporize it sure all kinds of things you can imagine um but but let's talk about the book yeah yeah so the first half of the book is cicero and it's drawn primarily from what sources How, how did this develop great so cicero wrote a manual on the art of public speaking and it's called De Oratore, three books. So on the orator, we would say maybe the ideal orator, how to be a public speaker. Uh, and it covers every aspect of public speaking. Some of it is pretty boring. Uh, and some of it only makes sense if you're reading Latin. But he built into it a separate module on the art of humor. And that's cool because it doesn't come from the traditional resource, the traditional sources that he's using. But he goes back to Hellenistic let us say Greek after Alexander the Great, theorizing on uh, humor and how to use it and what the rules are uh, for your public persona, how you stay on the fi- on the good side of the fine line between being witty and not crossing it and looking like a, a dimwit or a, you know, a buffoon. So uh, in this one, and we know it's a discrete module. There's actually a letter from Cicero that I didn't include in the book, but he refers to it. Uh, as basically a separate module. And like any dialogue of Cicero's, it's set in a particular period of time. So this can be a little disorienting. Uh, the main speakers are named Caesar and Mark Antony. <laughs> and as I say in the beginning, it, unfortunately, it's not the Caesar you know, and it's not the Mark Antony. These are two guys that nobody's ever heard of before. But Cicero distributes all his thoughts among these guys. He imagines them sitting out at a nice uh, weekend home, some beautiful villa in the suburbs of Rome. It's in his grandfather's day. And the, it's sort of this meeting of the retired great orators of his grandfather's time. And I said, well, 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 I remember the time you said this, or you said that. And they're sort of reliving their glory days. And one of them says, oh, Crassus, again, not the famous Crassus. Right. Crassus, you are hilarious. You're the greatest of all time. And they said, well, no, actually, this other guy, Julius Caesar Strabo, Strabo Vopiscus, he actually is very funny. And he knows everything about humor. So then they hand the microphone to him. He says, all right, you want to know about humor? Why don't you sit back and I'll tell you about humor? <laughs> and he goes through the remainder of the uh, dialogue that way. Hmm. That's fantastic. So I'm looking at page 63 here. And uh, I don't know if you have it, but I can just read you a little bit or just remind you of it. Yeah, I see you have it. That's great. So it's a suere Scipio at in mala olentem. Um, Scipio asks that in earnest, whereas it got grins. I love your translation here. It got grins when Philippus told a smelly guy, it seems you've goat me surrounded. <laughs> what What's going on here? What kind of dad jokery is this? Total dad joke, right? So <laughs> the Romans thought if you smell B.O. for the Romans was a goat. They okay. were all comparing people to goats. So if you look over at the Latin there, and I did this on purpose, and I'll probably get dinged by the purists who don't like this kind of thing, but you can see I, I indented all of the punchlines. Right. And he is trying to establish a pun here in the Latin. And so the Latin says, I see that uh, I have been surrounded by you. And the word for surrounded, circum veneri. And so as the commentaries had already figured out, it has to be pronounced 
kirkum when the ere. Instead of a kirkum, he's trying to make it sound like the Greek letter chi. Yeah. And then mm. it you to the word hirkum, which is right. a, is a goat. And as he says, just a little bit down below, he says, sub ridicule, sub ridicule. It's a little funny. It's dad <laughs> humorish. Mm. <laughs> You've goat me surrounded. <laughs> it's interesting. You know, Cicero loved puns. This is he's famous for his puns. But in the treaties, they make the point. They say puns are not really the way to appear witty in public. So when Quintilian looks back on this, he says, yeah, Cicero had some sort of puns that really a respectable person shouldn't be making. Hmm. And think about that, right? I mean, imagine some politician or some leader that you really respect. And if they're making a speech, you know, a graduation speech, and the president starts making puns. You, you got something against puns? I don't know. It depends on the quality of the pun. Really? Well, I'm, I'm looking at you're the king of puns. Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're, 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 you're uh, touching a third rail here. Yeah, <laughs> I'm starting to get a little uh, uncomfortable about this. <laughs> I have to say, I'm with you. This is what made me so upset when I'm reading the book because I love <laughs> puns myself. I wrote a book about puns. Once upon a time, and I was like, "Why don't more people love this?" <laughs> right, <laughs> and uh, they just. <laughs> but try this if you like puns. See if it gets you far in life. Cicero <laughs> says you should use story Late for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cicero says you should use story jokes, little story stories jokes, or one-liners that are not necessarily puns. And right. If you think about it, what happens when you don't get a pun? Right. You feel like you're you're outside the the literary ring. You feel kind of like a failure. So maybe that's why I meet such resistance uh, when I tell a pun is that I've accidentally shamed other people. Is that what you're suggesting? That's exactly what these guys suggest. Yeah, that's what mm-hmm. Cicero and Quintilian say. Maybe not in exactly those words, but that's the idea, right? When you you know when you want to appear witty, you want something the whole room is going to get if you're trying mm-hmm. to win. Today. And puns are alienating because the very best ones might take you a minute to figure out. Yeah. But I like that. I like that feeling. Someone tells a pun, I don't quite get it. And then four or five hours later, you know, I'm sitting at a meal and suddenly it dawns on me, right? <laughs> ah, that, that's really funny. You know, that delayed gratification. Well, Cicero would say that happens to you because you're a humorous guy. Hmm. I wrote a little bit about this in the introduction. You know, the Romans had this humoral theory of the body. And so they talk at length about this idea that if you have the right admixture of humors in you, you'll be a humorous person. So it's all chemical. This stuff's obvious. Exactly. Yeah, these are their Hmm. Huh. Michael, do you see any um, consistency between, you know, what's funny in Plautus to um, what, uh, you know, Cicero is laying down in his kind of his theory of of humor? Is there kind of a consistency in in kind of a, broadly speaking, a, a Roman uh, Roman sense of humor? That's a great question. Uh, the jokes in Roman comedy are in Plautus, not really in Terence, are much funnier. Uh, they uh, A lot of them are sort of base humor. They appeal to the body's appetites and needs. Right. So you find a lot of jokes about that. Uh, I do think there's a lot of puns in Plautus. I, that's what I wrote the book about, although I'm not sure I convinced everybody. So when I meet Plautus in the next life, I'm going to ask him, was I right about that? <laughs> but the... Um, the closest we get uh, in Roman comedy is not so much among the characters in dialogue, but there are these characters, the parasites. Mm. And several of the comedies, uh, they're about, um, just for the audience, there's 21 from Plautus comedies, 26 from Terence, uh, six from Terence. So we've got a lot of this stuff, 27 of them. These characters, the parasites will come out and they address the stage and they look very much like stand-up comedians. Uh, in fact, there's a comedy called The Stikus, and the parasite comes out. And it's interesting, pa- Plautus calls him the parasitos, but the Greek character that he's imitating is called the galotopoios, mm. the laughter maker, the jester. Yeah, yeah. And he goes through almost a routine. It's about maybe 80 or 100 lines long, joke after joke after joke. <laughs> um, and those are jokes when I read this stuff with students, they, te- they typically get them right away. Yeah. And with Cicero's, it's a little more refined. And so I, I put a footnote or two in the book. We don't even know what the heck he's talking about. For <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> That moment of uh, the meaning of the pun dawning on the listener, it's still waiting, right? 2,000 years later, it <laughs> well, still hasn't dawned. 
if you think about how we got all these Latin treatises, right? I mean, so Cicero wrote out a copy and then that was copied by hand and copied by hand. And the one thing we know is every time somebody copies something by hand, they make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of cases, it seems likely that anything that a pun like that would have been seen as a spelling mistake for the word that mm. was the joke about. And I think it's likely that a lot of this stuff was amended away by some idiotic scribe <laughs> at some point in the last 2000 years. <laughs> uh, so that probably, I mean, Latin is hard, but it's not that hard. Yeah, so we're coming on a, on a break here. And um, after the break, we want to talk about the second half of the book, which is Quintilian. But before we go to the break, you mentioned Terence. And so, Mike, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to interact with a little bit of this um, this famous quote attributed to Caesar about Terence, uh, that he was a puri sermonis amator, right? A lover of um, what? Undimmed eloquence or pure style, something like that. But, but he's not funny, right? Terence isn't funny. And I remember last time you explained this so well about how Terence is the outlier. Terence is the outlier. There's a great book that was uh, written by a scholar about 30, 40 years ago where he basically proved this. We have all these comedians. In fact, we even have a canon of the comedians written by a guy named Volcatius Sedigitus, presumably because he had six fingers uh, on each one or something. That's what Sedigitus means, or maybe six toes. And so we we have all these comedians' names, and we have fragments of a whole bunch of them. And the scholar lined them all up, and he says, Terence is the odd man out. So all of them were writing in the Plotine style, the stuff that gets a lot of laughs. And then you have Terence, which is kind of strange. The guy is interested in something else. He wants this comedy of manners, quiet sophistication. Um, and it's inevitable when you read Terence with anybody who's never read, they say, this stuff's not funny. I don't like, no. there's not a single joke anywhere in here. Uh, and so people were trying to figure out what this guy was up to, but it's not laughs. No. Uh, but the incredible thing, as you said, is that Terrence is the one who went on to become the school author. Right. Mm. So funny uh, comedians where uh, most of them are lost today. Plautus survives. Uh, he was considered the greatest, I guess. But uh, so, uh, what do we have? Julius Caesar. I'm trying to think who else. We have little poems from various people about Terence. And they say his colloquial Latin is the best. Yeah. You read it and you think, really? I, I actually <laughs> it, uh, it doesn't seem like the colloquial Latin of Cicero's letters. Uh, no. And it's not as easy as the colloquial Latin of uh, Plautus even. Right. But so your guess is as good as mine. I hope Caesar really meant it when he wrote it. Right, right. I wrote well, papers in college that I didn't really believe. <laughs> I might have done the same. So we're going to hear from Mike about uh, Quintilian after the break. This episode of Ad Nauseam is brought to you by Ratio Coffee. Ratio Coffee, ladies and gentlemen, listen closely, please. Mark Helwig and his team in Portland, Oregon have solved your aesthetic and brew-based problems. Why spend 4 to $6 on coffee purchased in some drive through when you can brew, get this, better coffee at home. The Ratio 6 and its big brother, the 8, beautiful automatic pour-over machines that consistently brew the finest Java. You want to check it out. That's right, Jeff. The Ratio 8, this is the one I have on my countertop at home. It's two ratios better than yours. Oh, you rub it in every time. I think time. you've got the every six. Every time. you got a bloom stage, don't you? I, well, of course. They don't come without a bloom stage. You bloom, and then what comes next? You bloom, and then it, then it brews. And then finally, ready. Ready. And when that little LED light flashes on the ready, and I... I take my carafe, this, you know, the carafe that you could use it in place of a tank, maybe if you needed to invade a country or something. Absolutely, yes. It's heavy and solid. I take it off. I put the little rubber stopper in the top. Yep. I'm ready to pour out delicious coffee for the next several hours. Exactly. What better way to to start things off? It's fantastic. I did just this morning. And so the, uh, the water comes coursing through the metallic veins, down through the cone, through my Ad Astra coffee beans. Mm -hmm. Stay tuned for the next ad. (laughs) And then it's just, it's fantastic. Delicious coffee. No burn flavor, no brackish tang. Jeff, how can our listeners, the um, the coffee files, how can they score some of this this wonderful ratio coffee? All they have to do is go to ratiocoffee.com, ratio r a t i o coffee.com right now and get now fit get a 15% exclusive discount on the ratio 6, the machine I have. Did you say 15%? I said 15. That's incredible. It's incredible. Enter the special code A N C O for 15% off the ratio 6, A N C O ratiocoffee.com. 
Check it out. This week's episode is also brought to you by Odd Ostra Coffee Roasters, the coffee that takes you to the stars, but you don't have to go per aspera through the harsh stuff. Yes, we are thrilled to have Odd Ostra Roasters on board here at Odd Nauseam. Specialty coffee, veteran-owned out of Hillsdale, Michigan, just a couple hours down the road from where we are at the Vomitorium. Absolutely. And this week, what arrived in the mail? Some... You want to... You, I'm going to let you say, say it? it? No, you're going to say it. You always say it, right. <laughs> the Huehuetenango. And I was thinking about, isn't that... Have you seen Shawshank Redemption? Yes. Isn't this? Isn't that the place where... I hate that movie. Don't even get me started. Okay. I don't care if you hate it. Everybody right. loves it. I hate it. Isn't it where they meet up at the end? Huehuetenango. Is that, isn't that the, the place where they go? Something and, about a boat. There's a boat. Right. Never I, I don't know. <laughs> Let's talk about coffee. Okay, okay. Huehue Tenango arrived in the mail this week. Yes. Still love uh, Tenebris very much, but when Patrick sent me that Huehue Tenango, it's really delicious. It's perfectly roasted. There are notes of, I don't know, um, there's a cinnamon kind of flavor in there. There's a little bit of walnut and pecan flavors. It's really complicated, delicious coffee. Uh, notes. There are notes in I think. Is yeah, notes. Sure? Exactly. I right. said notes, didn't I? Did you say notes? Okay. I well, did. All right. Okay. Well, I was just underlining the note part. Okay, fine, fine. <laughs> Take a note. But not only the Hue Hue Tenango, what else do they have? They got, well, they got this um, exclusive uh, poetry series. Yes. Where they've got uh, Wordsworth and the Rilke and all your favorite poets on the bag itself. Yes, yeah, so while you're brewing up and uh, watching the, the ratio do its magic, you can also read a little bit of poetry. It's really, really nice. So what are we giving our listeners if they, uh, I should say, what is Odd Astra giving our listeners if they go to the site? If they go to oddastraroasters.com. A D A S T R A roasters.com. You get 10% off, listeners. All you have to do is enter code A N A A to get 10% off any order. And you could also sign up for their monthly subscription. You should definitely check it out. It's a beautiful website. They, uh, they show you some of the process of how they roast these delicious beans. So check it out. Today's episode is also sponsored by Hackett Publishing. Now, Dave, I know you've been in that situation where all you want to do is sit on the porch, smoke your cigar, and read your favorite stuff. <laughs> <laughs> My classical stuff? Yes. You know, you're into that classical stuff. But all you can find is some horrible, turgid tome that's almost unreadable in terms of its translation. And that does happen from time to time. If I am indeed reading a translation, I don't go in for turgidity. No, that's a good, a good thing to avoid. Turgidity? It does happen, but Hackett has changed all that, dear listener. With the click of a button, you can be on your way to discovering Hackett's deep well of attractive, affordable, accessible translations from the entire sweep of the Greco-Roman era. Yeah, and not only that, but other areas of, of academic interest as well. They've got great classical connection, but Check out their website and you can see how deep it goes. Yes, indeed it does. I also love the Latin series that they now carry, the Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata. That's your go-to, isn't it? It is, yes. For Hans Orberg, wonderful Latinity and uh, very, very highly recommended. So, Jeff, once again, I have to ask, how can our listeners take advantage of what we are offering them today through Hackett? Well, ad nauseanators, you two can save 20% on any order and receive free shipping from Hackett Publishing. All you have to do is go to hackettpublishing.com, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, publishing.com, find the text you want, enter the code AN2021 in the box, which asks for the coupon code. Do it today. That's a pretty hefty discount, isn't it? 20% and free shipping. Yeah, that, that's really remarkable. I don't think you can get that elsewhere. No. You want to add that closing line once again? Don't wait. <laughs> All right, we are back. Uh, Mike, I wonder if you could talk to us about the, the second half of your book a bit about um, the quintillion half and um, how that responds to uh, the first half and, and uh, what, what's, what's, what's different and what's kind of the argument that quintillion is making. Great. So quintillion lived about 150 years after Cicero, and it's a totally different world that he's born and grows up and comes of age in. So Cicero was assassinated just as the Republic, 500 years old, was sliding into this sort of monarchy or autocracy that it never really emerged from ever again. And by the time uh, Quintilian is born in Spain, uh, Rome had been an empire with a single emperor for quite a long time. And he was like us. He's an academic, right? So Cicero, I always tell people, he was the man in the arena. He's the guy that gets out there and fights for the policies that he thinks are best, uh, even at the cost of his own life. Uh, the experimental person. Quintilian, a guy like me, sitting in a study, reading all these books, trying to distill the best practices, the most effective stuff, 
and see what works. And he ended his career as the world's first chair of Latin literature appointed by uh, Trajan or Hadrian, I forget off the top mm. of my head. And so he was sort of the first person to go back and read Cicero's handbook on the art of being a, a, an ideal public speaker. And Quintilian wrote his own uh, sort of sequel or, or updated textbook in which Cicero's ideas play a part, but uh, they're contextualized with many other people as well. So Cicero's book on the art of public speaking is three books long. You know, um, Quintilian's is 10 or 11. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's quite a bit longer. Uh, and again, though, he has what he calls a separate module on the art of humor. And he says, this is essential if you want to learn how to do this stuff. Uh, and there are a lot of great models. But what I found fascinating is not only that he's read Cicero and a whole bunch of other authorities, but he's now living in a world where you have to really watch what you say. Mm. Uh, it's not the old boys network where you could take the tar out of somebody and then slap each other on the back and go get a beer. Uh, he's living in a in a world where stuff can get reported to the emperor, mm -hmm. it can report it to higher ups. You know, if you make a uh, a joke about Augustus, I mean, or who, do you really want to be brought in to <laughs> explain that? I, I, I'm not sure you do. And so the world has totally changed. Um, it changes his analysis of the humor a little bit. But in general, he's still interested in how you're going to win arguments in the short term and in the long term. In a way, Quintilian's is maybe even a little more effective for the right. social media world that we're living in today. Absolutely. You know, you tweet, uh, I hope you like that tweet. <laughs> Yes, because mm -hmm. it can be uh, unearthed even several years later. You may be seeing it again. Yeah, that's right. So the the very beginning of the second half of the book on the art of humor, uh, you quote from the um, Institutio Oratoria, right, book six. And I love the idiomacy of your translations. I think you've done just a, a bang up job. Now, the more idiomatic a translation is, right, you can attest to this, perhaps the shorter the shelf life, right? So sometimes what you what you might sacrifice in terms of immediacy, uh, or what you gain in terms of immediacy, right? It, it may not last as long. I hope that's not the case, but I just wanted to read this little paragraph here because it's quite good. Yet another skill that orators should cultivate is getting the jury to laugh. Doing that breaks up their upset emotions, takes their mind off the facts, and sometimes even snaps them out of it. That's just brilliant, Mike, and gives them a fresh start when they're tired or bored. So can you can you talk a little bit about the kinds of translation choices that you made and how you tried to to maybe balance if that's the right term uh, accuracy against um, contemporary contemporaneity contemporaneity maybe yeah thanks I uh, you know I, I did that very deliberately with the book uh, I think we talked a little bit last time it is having a total polarizing effect on readers so far hmm. uh, people either totally love the way I did it, or they think that Cicero and Quintilian could have never talked that way. It's impossible. Mm. I, in fact, a friend of mine told me that the other day. He, said, he couldn't have talked that way. I said, okay, you don't actually know Latin, but that's all good. Uh, <laughs> but so yeah, right. I mean, what do we want to do? These people were alive and they're trying right. to communicate to us. And you know, if you make them sound, st they don't sound stilted in Latin. And Cicero's in particular is very clear. It's colloquial Latin. These guys are bantering back and forth with each other. And they're making puns as they speak. Quintilian is making puns as he goes. And you want to sound immediate. And for me, idioms sound immediate. Phrasal verbs sound immediate. You know, go in instead of saying enter. Uh, that kind of thing. Right. Um, and I use the word get a lot. And I tested it out uh, on some of the neighborhood kids because I worked on this during the, the shutdown, the early days of the shutdown. I was under a bit of a deadline to get this thing in. And uh, I was at the time, you know, we, um, busy with, you know, trying the chaos of online teaching and all that sort of thing. And so I got the neighborhood kids. I said, what are we going to call this one? Said, We're going to call it a sick burn. Mm. A sick burn. <laughs> and so uh, I said, I'm pretty sure I had never used that phrase before, but it's already... People love it. They know exactly what a sick yeah. is. Mm -hmm. uh, or they know what um, roasting is, right? So I had right. a couple of different choices. And I, I worked with an undergrad. She said, no, no, you got to say roast. Roast, roast, roast. That is what the kids are saying today. Yep. Mm. And, uh, and they so say lit. It. And they say sketch. And they say sus. Sus, yeah. Which is short for suspicious, yeah. I guess. Oh, boy. Are you, you know, so <laughs> I tried to do is avoid slang. In the, okay. And I, this is all subjective, right? But it's definitely going to have a short shelf life, and that's totally fine. That's what these books are for. 
Mm. Uh, Cicero has been around 2,100 years. He will be around after me. Oh, sure. Uh, but so what I wanted to do was reach the current moment and reach people who are not academics, reach people who don't know Latin and just say, hey, folks, this is our world heritage here, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, these are some brilliant ideas people thought pretty hard about. Um, so there's an audio book uh, for this one, as there was for the last one. Oh, really? And believe it or not, people listen to Cicero and they listen to Quintilian <laughs> in an audio book. Uh, Are you the reader, Mike? No, you know, they get a professional voice actor. This guy's oh. pretty good. Uh, he can do different voices. And it's halfway between sort of an English accent and halfway between an American. Huh. So That's too bad Mel Blanc is not around anymore because he yeah, would really. be the Looney Tunes guy. He'd be the perfect one to do this. When we did How to Drink, I wanted Charlie Sheen to read it, but I don't think it's <laughs> perfect. That's very on the nose. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mentioned shelf life, but the, the immediacy is just phenomenal, right? If, if you want to know how people were talking at a particular time, you pick up an idiomatic translation from that time for sure. Yeah, thank you. I uh, And if people don't like this, the lobes are there. People can go out and see what people thought was funny 100 years ago. I can tell you some of the jokes are not as funny in the older ones. But uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> so Or they just put, thing, they put them into Italian, right? <laughs> when it gets a little right? <laughs> Oh, I can say that. There are no obscene jokes in this book. Uh, oh. there are no obscene jokes, of course, if you read Aristophanes, there's lots of obscenity. Sure, but, right. But... Uh, Roman humor is not obscene. And Quintilian himself says, don't do it. Not only don't be obscene, but don't even hint at obscenity. Really? If you do, you will compromise your whole persona. Hmm. Now, that said, because everybody loves this stuff, Cicero does have a letter, and it's all about obscene puns. And it's ad familiares 9.22. Better pause a moment because everyone's going to go write that down, right? <laughs> Race to the internet. Quick, find it. He had a, a young correspondent, this is some dude named Papirius Pitus. And this guy, I guess uh, they got into an argument. Does such a thing as obscenity exist? And Cicero huh. says, I'm going to use stoic argumentation. We're going to split it down the middle. It do, it's either from the words or the actions. <laughs> and he proves in the words section, he says, well, I can make words sound like these dirty words, but I'm not really hmm. saying a word, am I? Uh, so, <laughs> uh, that stuff's all out there. You can read that. No, one thing I was going to say about the translation um, that might be of interest is I tried to do a lot of cultural translation, not as much as my instincts were. I was going to make it almost entirely updated sort of polit- social titles, political offices, technology. Um, but various voices said, no, nah, you're taking it too far. This is you should dial it back. So I really struck a balance where it, uh, they sound, I hope, like people today, but it's clear that they're living in ancient Rome. Right. Uh, and the only ones where I really changed it was where I thought it would be totally distracting, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to suddenly refer to somebody as um, a military tribune. Now, I don't think too many people today walking down the street know what a military tribune of ancient Rome was. So right. I tried to figure out what the relevant point of the person being a military tribune was and then update it. Mm-hmm. So I did a fair amount of that sort of thing. I think um, it's quite successful on the whole. Uh, if you have um, if you got page 153 there, I was, I was hoping you could read us that opening paragraph because it touches on something that Jeff asked last time about the connection between uh, humor and appearance. I don't know if you remember that, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah, I think I do. Yeah. You so the part that begins, that? yeah, moreover, genetics. Yeah. So he says, moreover, genetics don't merely determine whether a person's wittier and quicker at coming up with ideas, because teaching really could improve that. Now, some people just intrinsically have a special look about them, the way they move their face, the way they move their face, such that the same jokes don't seem as funny when someone else tells them. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, I can't remember, Jeff, if we talked about a last time. For me, the we're... iconic figure is Dave Chappelle. <laughs> yes. His yes. Face, when that guy tells a joke, even when he doesn't tell a joke, right? Yes. He's so smirking. You can't, I can't not laugh. It's He's not. also one of those rare guys that can laugh at his own joke and it does not come off as ridiculous and, and cloying and stupid it's it just adds to it you know where he will you know he'll pop the microphone on his on his thigh and kind of do that backward shuffle um it, it's it, it, it's it's so great it's so great you were asking about um 
I think Jeff, you used Jim Gaffigan as an example, right? We, we, if, we he ta- lo- if he looks like George Clooney or, yes. or Brad Pitt, or even like one of us, <laughs> right? right, with but, our uh, Adonic-like appearance, yeah. I think it's I think it's much more difficult for uh, attractive, classically attractive people to be funny, or like like if uh, if Brad Pitt told a Gaffigan joke, I don't think it would work. Mm. Um, That's a brilliant idea, and if I can interject. I think you're totally right. Why? Because you remember the TV show Friends? They're doing a reunion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you couldn't escape it when we were coming of age. Brad Pitt guest starred on an episode of Friends. And he is so horribly unfunny in that episode. <laughs> it's painful to watch. <laughs> and it makes it clear how talented all the other actors in the show are. Yeah. Um, he... Because you know, certainly at the time he was an incredibly handsome guy. He was in all these famous movies. This is he's a- like an Achilles, frankly. But <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I think David and we've talked about this. If if you are really attractive, you don't have to be funny, right? Because people are naturally drawn to you. You don't have to. You don't have to work. And and so, do you have to develop a sense of humor if you're if you're notches you, below you're that? Compensating. If you want to attract women. Uh, uh, as a, as a, is know. that where this podcast is going? Winkle? <laughs> well, you have to, if you can't draw them with just your, your aura, yeah. you have to be funny. Well, I think people like to be entertained, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, humor can go a long way to, to make it up when you think any kind of deficit right. that you think. I mean, in my own case, I'm both handsome and funny, Jeff. So okay. <laughs> Humor, yeah, everybody loves humor, right? I, uh, in a partner, in friends, everything. Yeah. Um, uh, we talked a little bit, you know, um, we should talk a little bit about uh, the concept of humor in Latin. So the first mm-hmm. thing, actually, I can say this. When you read the book, if you look at the Latin, you'll see Latin doesn't have a word for humor in the sense that we use it. Right. Uh, I mean, of course, again, it gets challenging. Humor is a Latin word, but back then it means chemical. Uh but so they have to use all these strange, uh, what we call the hendiades. Do, mm-hmm. Does the audience know this fancy term? I don't and, know, right? The two through one, right? That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. So you need two words to say the same thing, and you put the word and in between them. So the very at the very, very beginning of Cicero's, he talks uh, about, uh, I think, joking and funny stories. And in the context, it's obvious that he's talking about humor in the general concept. So Latin as a language doesn't even get a word for humor until the Italian Renaissance. Wow. When uh, some guy finally just says, all right, enough, basta. And he coins a word. And it's facetudo, facetitude. Mm-hmm. Would be the English word, I guess. And the That's idea, not funny, Mike. Facetitude. Well, it's been <laughs> uh, he writes a brilliant supplement to all this, and he talks about how humor can lubricate social life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, when you walk into an awkward space or empty silence, you can fill it with humor. Yeah, sure, you can win the room. As we began today, we're talking about Cicero as successful politician. Uh, any politicians who try to entertain the audience? I mean, we mentioned last time, um, and you and I seemed to have some agreement on this, that Quintilian tells us there are three purposes of communication, right? Uh, Decaira, delectara, moera. And most politicians, they don't work at all to entertain us. They're just right and left, dull as dirt. So, so why is that? And what has changed? Well, yeah, I mean, we have seen politicians who tell lots and lots and lots of jokes. Uh, They can tell some pretty mean spirited jokes, in fact. Uh, And people, sometimes they win and sometimes they don't win. If you look across the landscape today, yeah, they don't seem interested in entertaining us. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's interesting to sort of puzzle out why. Why don't they want to entertain us? Well, of course, some have serious policy points to make, but maybe it's what you know, people want today. Do we want to be entertained or do we want people who are going to engage with the issues? I want to be entertained. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just for the record. Yeah, most, people, yeah, most people do. You know, who's not good at humor at all is Joe Biden. I don't know if you follow uh-huh. these. Things, but I watch, you know, politicians and public figures trying to use humor. Joe Biden so far has not been very good at all. And he no. gave a speech just last week to a graduating class and it was he a military a class, wasn't it? That's it. You saw yeah, that one. I saw the joke. clip. 
And nobody laughed. And he basically said, oh, what's wrong with you people? That's not. And if you should have read my book. Because just <laughs> no, you would say that's what you you don't insult people when they tell when no. you, they don't laugh. Uh, so he's you know who is however very good at strategic humor, excellent. This was also in the news last week. Is Jeff Bezos? Oh, really? Uh, if you remember when he was busted for having an affair, what was that a year or two ago? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was big, big news, and. Um, you know, all kinds of compromising information was coming out and he was being shamed all across the planet. Uh, the, this article I read last week says he went into a business meeting and uh, he sat down and everybody's waiting with bated breath. What you say? <laughs> and he says, all right, everybody raise your hand if you think you've had a tougher week than me. <laughs> and everybody laughed. And, all right, let's just focus on business. And that's hmm. exactly the technique that Cicero and Quintilian tell you to do. Hmm. So it was like a master class in how to reset social dynamics. Do you know if anybody raised their hand when he asked that question? Because <laughs> you know that do? would take moxie. Oh, that would be incredible. Try this. So when I have done department meetings or group meetings in, in higher ed, uh, we all sit down. I just, uh, if we're about to make a decision, I say, before we vote, raise your hand if you're against groupthink. Yeah. <laughs> well, immediately raises their hand. Like, does anybody want to give the opposite point of view before we vote? Yeah, I sometimes ask groups, raise your hands if you're against democracy, right? And <laughs> I think you said there are um that you've you've served on 37 separate committees at Cornell. Is that right? Big red? Yes. Yeah, so we uh I started out uh, about 10 years ago, I decided to get more involved in central university administration. So I spent about a decade doing this stuff. For the and joy of it, right? Exactly. What else is there? No, it was for all the money. They paid me a fortune. No. <laughs> <laughs> it was more like uh, Cicero's on duties. No. Nah, so I, I volunteered that, I don't know why, to run um, all these faculty senate committees that we have. And, you know, everybody's got their student council. We have a faculty council. And uh, I thought when I first volunteered, it'd be a very minimal commitment. It turned out that uh, the person in charge wanted me to attend all of the meetings. Mm. So uh, at first I was aghast. And then over time, I was like, you know, I'm learning more about this university than anyone on campus. Right. To all these meetings. uh, I wish I had not gone to all of them. But yeah, I went to. Uh, you name it, we did it. The parking committee, the benefits committee, the education committee. <laughs> um, but it actually is good. So Party planning wants, committee, right? Yeah, that one I missed. <laughs> but it is cool. If anybody's an academic listening, I would encourage you to get involved in the same thing, maybe at your own institution, wow. in part because you can learn a lot about it. And it doesn't take long before you know more about the way these huge places are run than almost anybody on campus. Wow. And is there any humor in it, though, is what I yeah, would like did, to know. Mike, you, you, you brought the humor to all of these meetings, right, I hope. I did, yes. Uh, of course. Yeah. And so <laughs> uh, mine was a volunteer position, but I was in charge. And everybody that came to these committees uh, was also a volunteer. And when you ask a lot of people to volunteer their time, they don't always want to do it. Hmm. Um, and we would assemble these committees. Every committee was an ad hoc grouping of people. Uh, and Cornell here is gigantic. I think we have... Some of 3,000 faculty, if you count in all the various appointments. Oh, my. Wow. Uh, I mean, it's maybe not quite that many, but close. And uh, so we would often walk into a room full of strangers, and you've got, you know, the brain scientist and the chemical engineer and the mathematician and the, you know, the humanities person. And you say, how are you going to get these people to, on the same page to work toward whatever the goal is? And so I found that using humor got more buy in than hmm. any other tool I had at my disposal. Incredible. Sure. So I have I have two questions, final questions for myself. Je- Jeff may have a few others, but the, f- the first one is uh, something we didn't cover last time, and that is the captatio benevolentiae, right? Getting people's goodwill at the beginning of a speech, the captatio. What's your preference? Self-deprecating or some kind of uh, joke at the audience's expense, a little bit of a, a needling or... Uh, helping them not take themselves too seriously. Which do you think is most effective? That is, can I pick a third choice? Sure, sure. Yeah. If you so don't care I, for false dichotomies, go ahead. I mean, if you're going to trap me like this. So if you want to be a leader in public, Cicero and Quintilian are crystal clear. Don't tell jokes at your own expense. Just mm-hmm. 
Uh, now, the one time you do is when you're busted. You know, if the um, police officer pulls you over and you've been speeding, that is the time to do it. Or, uh, you know, the newspaper calls and, uh, you know, you've been caught doing something naughty. A joke can spare you uh, at your own expense. Uh, I also wouldn't, if I didn't have to tell a joke at the audience's expense, if I could find a good neutral third party. Uh, so I have a couple of go-to jokes. Everybody should get some go-to jokes. Um, uh, a great one, though, is if you walk into a meeting and there's 15 or 20 people there and everybody's drinking coffee, you can just hold up your coffee mug and say, I have a question. If I get hit with this thing, have I been mugged? Uh, it's just, that's what we call a bad pun, <laughs> Fontaine. It is a bad pun, but that one shows effort. That works well in small yeah, groups. It's great. And then they say, they say, no, come on, we just got to lighten up. I need to finish my coffee and then we'll get it. <laughs> when I was an undergrad, I was washing out a ceramic mug, true story, and it was sharp because it was cut and it cut my finger and I had to go get stitches for this. And thereafter, I told everyone I was mugged. <laughs> <laughs> so the second question is, um, <clears throat> last time we talked about the inability to turn off the funny, right? Certain individuals, and Cicero seems to have been one of these, right? He, he lost his sense of location, you might say, and the wit just poured out of him so effusively, it actually landed him in a lot of hot water. They make, Cicero makes this point emphatically at almost the very beginning of his treaties, Although the speaker, a guy named Caesar does, he says, if you're a quick witted person, the hardest thing in the world is to hold back a joke. I mean, you're sitting there and somebody says something double edged. And if you're ready to exploit it, make a joke, it, you've got to bite your tongue. He says, it's like your mouth is on fire. Uh. It's easier to put out <laughs> flames than make that wise crap. You're just dying to do it. Yeah. And, uh, and if you're a quick-witted person, you know that this is true, right? And so, you know, a mark of maturity, a mark of self-preservation is you don't say these things. Right. I don't have a spotless record of this myself. <laughs> but I try very hard uh, because, you you know, it's easy to hurt somebody's feelings that way. But yes, sure. I put this stuff into the introduction. I said, you know, the crazy thing is Cicero himself, here he is in his treaties giving us this advice. And then when he was assassinated about 12 years later, 11 years later, this is the thing that his ancient biographer Plutarch cites as one of the reasons that he fell afoul of uh, Mark Antony. He couldn't keep his stupid mouth shut. He keeps mm -hmm. making all these jokes. Uh, and so uh, it's ironic in a way that I don't think Cicero could have possibly ever foreseen. <laughs> it's good advice. If you're ready, if you want to land a sick burn, grandma says something you know, open right. store at Thanksgiving or don't. Yeah, hold back. So I don't know if I'm a witty person, but this phenomenon usually happens to me um, like at a faculty meeting, right? Or a department meeting. I think, oh, there's a golden opportunity. I, oh, it's, it's, I'm going to lose it if I don't take it, but you got to hold back. Yeah. So Jeff, you have yeah. any wrap up questions from I, Mike? I do. But my, my last question would be about the context that Quintilian is writing. It struck me that and you mentioned, you know, Trajan and Hadrian, is uh, if you see that as kind of an era where, again, get humor's back on the table, you know, the kind of the post-Augustan, Julio-Claudian era seems to be a pretty dry spell for humor. You, I mean, you have Petronius, um, who, you know, may have, you know, paid for his humor with his with his own life. But you start to get figures like, you know, Marshall, and, uh, Juvenal, Lucian, Apuleius. Do you see that as kind of part of, uh, Quintilian is part of the, like the second sophistic where, it's a little bit looser. It's a little bit more open uh, for these kinds of discussions. It's a little bit open for the the, the comedian. It's a great question again. Uh, I think I'd probably say uh, Quintilian's in a separate category from all those other authors, right? Okay. When I think of Juvenal, I think of Lucian, I think of uh, the satirical writers, that sort of thing, Marshall. Uh, that's definitely witty, and, and it's witty in a refined way. But there, I think the the aim seems to be to entertain people much more. Hmm. Uh, and Quintilian is pretty clear that he is here to instrumentalize humor for you as a leader, as a public figure, as a anybody speaking in public, for you to get ahead. Gotcha. And so the joke, uh, he would the first thing he would say is, if the joke is not going to win your court case or win your election or win whatever you're trying to sell, then don't do humor. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, so uh, for him, it's just uh, a tool 
in the kit. And I think yeah, whereas so- when you, the other authors uh, are all funny, but in different ways. Hmm. <laughs> Well, we want to thank you again, Mike, for uh, not only recording the first time, but recording the second time and making it even better than the first time. Absolutely. And we're we're so grateful. Any parting words of wisdom to our listeners who may be aspiring classicists, aspiring comedians? Aspiring classicists, learn Latin, learn it well. Latin is a wonderful language, and it doesn't take that much to get really good at it. Awesome. Uh, Keep at it. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you very much. Again, we want to thank our guest, Michael Fontaine, so much for coming on. We have some more people to thank, don't we, Jeff? We do. Uh, uh, Mishka, our intrepid engineer, as always, does a wonderful job. Scott Vinzen and Ken Tamplin for the great music that you hear in the the podcast. Uh, Always uh, indebted and very thankful to these people. Right. And I'm going to talk for just a brief half second about the Moss Method. Why not spend your summer learning Greek? Why not? Why not? Go to mossmethod.com. Check out my program. It is expert, self-paced, and accessible. Also, uh, it's inexpensive. It's not going to cost you an arm and a leg. And we're going to be running a summer promo. So stay tuned in subsequent episodes. Jeff, what do we have uh, coming up next week? Oh, man, I'm excited. We're going to do the Mysteries of Mithras. Uh, the Mysteries of Mithras. Yes. What, what kind of a creature is that? The, myth- uh, the worship of Mithras was a, what we call mystery cult in the ancient world. And it was very popular, very widespread through a good chunk of the, of the Roman Empire. Deeply hmm. influential um, and really intriguing and mysterious in every sense of that word. Hmm. This is some uh, area where you have quite a bit of expertise, so you're going to be taking the lead in this. Absolutely. And we're going to go through that. Yeah. So listeners, uh, be sure to check that out. Please subscribe, leave a review at your favorite podcast site. We continue to get wonderful listener mail. Uh, Dave at adnauseum.com or Jeff at adnauseum.com. Don't forget, nauseum has a V in it. And uh, Jeff, I think you have the gustatory parting shot. Is that right? I do. Um, and once again, I'm borrowing from the realm of, uh, of pop music. That's you, isn't it? It is, exactly. Ah, okay. And this comes from Pink Floyd, from their song, Another Brick in the Wall. If you don't eat your meat, you can't have any pudding. How can you have any pudding if you don't eat your meat? Ah, indeed. How can you? <laughs> How can you? Thanks for listening. Thanks.